Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome here to today's. My name is Christian Fisher. I'm the uh, director here. And uh, a warm welcome not only to the people who are in this, uh, this auditorium, but also to the, all to the many good people who are following this on the uh, live streaming uh, we're having here uh, today. Uh, and it's really nice to have a, uh, a full auditorium. Uh, I still see people coming in, taking the, the last uh, vacant seats. Uh, but of course it is on a, on a sad, a truly sad and, and also a very disturbing background, namely the, the war in, in Ukraine. Um, over the last uh, decade or so, there's been quite a bit of a talk about the return of geopolitics. Uh, and if anyone had uh, doubts about uh, the return of geopolitics, then the uh, shocking events of uh, Ukraine uh, must have uh, made a, a, a big Im impact. I believe that the, um, the uh, uh, latest Russian invasion clearly is a major earthquake in, in, in our lifetime. And, um, and the uh, uh, current armed conflict and the uh, international crisis, uh, which goes together with that, certainly has the potential to deteriorate even uh, further. Uh, and it certainly looks like we're entering a new era in international relations, and therefore we have asked for this seminar, uh, how can we understand this new si situation? Um, therefore, uh, we are probably, all of us, uh, uh, consuming quite large uh, portions of news uh, these weeks from our laptops, from our uh, TV uh, sets and, and, and mobile phones. Uh, and you have probably already heard quite a few of the uh, 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 researchers from these commenting on and explaining also on, on a number of the complex issues related to, to the war. And here at these we w wanted to, uh, to dig a, big, a bit deeper than uh, the time which is often allowed uh, for, for researchers in, the, um, in, in many news programs. And therefore, we wanted to give you a more comprehensive insight uh, into the many key issues that we all speculate about in these uh, difficult times. And therefore, we have gathered a number of researchers uh, from these plus one uh, from outside, Thomas, who's here. Uh, but he's a former these colleague, so, uh, so welcome back. <laughs> And uh, we wanted to present a uh, what we call a pretty comprehensive uh, package of research-based knowledge uh, for you, and we hope that this uh, package will uh, will uh, of knowledge will be be useful for you in your further uh, talks and uh, and and thoughts about uh, the the current uh, crisis. We have two sessions uh, here in the morning, uh, and from uh, 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 noon till uh, one o'clock there will be a presentation by senior researcher uh, Fleming Smithful Hansen who's probably known to most of, uh, most of you uh, from the media. And I now hand over to uh, Robin May Scott, uh, who is a senior researcher here at, uh, at DEES. And Robin will introduce the respective speakers in the first session. And uh, this morning, and you will also be moderating the Q&A session, which we have uh, after the first session. And we also have one after the second session. We like to have a bit of interactive communication at these events. Robin, the floor is yours. Thank you. And thank you all for uh, coming out today. Um, as uh, Christian has already mentioned, uh, the, uh, since the invasion by Russia of the Ukraine on February 24th, it seems that the world has shifted its access, and we're all grappling with trying to understand how we can do that. Many of our researchers uh, and researchers in Denmark and internationally uh, have been very busy in the media trying to do that. What we as researchers have the privilege of doing is being able to look at the deep currents uh, trying to see connections between actual events as they are unfolding and inter frameworks for interpreting the big picture. So today we'll be setting focus on that, looking at issues that are thematically, geographically, and globally important for understanding the war as it is unfolding and its implications for the future. Uh, our, as Christian has mentioned, we're having a very concise presentations, 10 minutes each. And at the end of the first three speakers, we'll have a Q&A. Uh, at that point, we will ask uh, you in the audience, when you s ask your questions, to mention your name, your affiliation, and keep your, comment your questions brief and to the point, as uh, our time is short. Uh, with that, I'm very happy to introduce our first speaker today, and that is Fleming Spisbol Hansen who will give us a status on where we are now, what can we expect, 
Fleming, as many of you know, is an expert on the post-Soviet space, including Russia and the Ukraine. Thank you, um, and thank you for this uh, warm introduction. So I've been asked to say a few words about where we are and what can we expect. But before that, let me say uh, perhaps a few words about how we arrived at where we are now. And uh, what I'm increasingly encouraging people to do is to view the Soviet Union as an empire. So the former Soviet Union as an empire, many of us tend to forget this. Some people forget this for political, ideological reasons. They don't like to think of the Soviet Union as an empire. Some think, uh, forget it because it's not uh, a traditional empire. It didn't have overseas colonies. The colonies were attached to the mainland. But if you think of the Soviet Union as an empire, it, it, the whole struggle, the war that we see now is suddenly framed in a different way. In the same way as we easily think of the Russian Empire as an empire, it's even part of the term that we use for it, but the Soviet Union as an empire. And what we've seen now and what we've seen perhaps in the past few years, most recently also in Kazakhstan, is sort of the last spasms of an empire. So an empire which has lost its colonies. The colonies that are increasingly trying to break free, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, for instance, managed to do so at an early stage and joined the European Union and NATO. Other the former colonies are still struggling to do so. Kazakhstan, for instance, which saw the introduction of Russian troops in January, Moldova, Georgia, um, Ukraine now also. So perhaps it's a kind of post-colonial struggle that we've seen on part of these states, but also perhaps a neo-imperialist policy on part of Russia. So a neo-imperialist policy which has become increasingly clear over the past few years, a policy designed to reintroduce uh, Russian influence in these areas, perhaps even Russian hegemony within these areas. Um, it's been a clear ambition on part of Putin, absolutely, no one doubted this, he said this openly. He regrets, of course, uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union. He often referred to it as such and said that it's, uh, it's, it's the greatest geopolitical catastrophe or tra tragedy of the 20th century. And he has made clear on numerous occasions that he wants to increase Russian influence in these areas by political, economic, or even military means. So I encourage you perhaps as, an, as a beginning to view this as a post-colonial struggle on part of some of these former Soviet republics and as a kind of neo-imperialist Russian foreign policy designed to reintroduce Russian influence into these areas. Part of, of where we stand today, of course, also needs to be explained by taking a look at what happens inside Russia. Um, I clearly was one of the people who said I did not believe in a big, large-scale war, and of course I was wrong. Uh, but when we look at the decision-making, it still seems odd. Uh, now we are in the fourth week. On a Thursday, it will be a full month. Um, but when we woke up on the 21st, uh, 24th of February, and we all remember uh, this date, uh, it was clear that something has changed. We woke up in a different world, a different Europe. Russia had changed, Ukraine uh, definitely had changed, it will also change, uh, but the decision was still odd. Um, we still need to do an aut autopsy at some point and to see what was the actual decision making. Uh, but the decision making could have been poor intelligence, for instance, inside the Kremlin. Uh, it could have been a poor understanding of Ukraine, for instance, or even Russian society. And it could have, of course, also been poor advice given to Russian President Putin. There are lots of rumors right now about what is going on inside the Kremlin, inside the intelligence community, that people are really upset. Putin is very upset. Some of his closest friends and allies are really upset about the poor advice that was given. For instance, the FSB, the Domestic Security Service, apparently was uh, tasked with, uh, with preparation of the war, trying to paint a picture of the political culture within Ukraine. So how would they receive Russian troops? And it was clear that they also failed if it's true, of course, that they were tasked with this. But it's interesting to see how the authoritarian regime, the authoritarian dictatorship, may carry within itself its own demise in the way that it becomes too closed, it becomes too self-supplying, it becomes too sort of concentrated on itself. And for those of you who saw the uh, Security Council session, which Putin presided, of course, just before the introduction of the war, just before uh, Russia invaded Ukraine, you would see, of course, a dictator sort of commanding uh, his people around. And these are mo some of the most powerful people within the Russian system. So it's very difficult uh, for us to imagine that these people would be critical of any decision that he has made. They would sort of gloss it all over and present a positive picture to him. 
Anyways, we stand where we where we do. It's a um, it's a major war. It's the biggest war in Europe since uh, the Second World War. It's a terrifying war, and uh, even as we speak on uh, on this Monday morning, a humanitarian catastrophe, of course, is unfolding uh, throughout Ukraine, in particular, of course, around the city, in and around the city of Mariupol. Um, and it's clear that Russia has not achieved what it wanted to do. So there may have been a plan A, which was to drive quickly down to Kiev, grab President uh, Volodymyr Zelensky, bring him to Moscow and put him before a tribunal. Uh, so plan A definitely failed and probably Putin's advisors told him that plan A, uh, plan A was feasible, that we do have the military power to do so, the Ukrainians will be welcoming us and so we can easily do this, and we know from Russian sources that this was plan A, plan A to go straight to Kiev. So now it's plan B, maybe plan C, maybe even plan D. And it's clear that the Russians have several gears. They can change gears, they can up their military game, and we saw this over the weekend also with the firing of a hypersonic missile. There's been a lot of talk in, in past few years about Russian hypersonic missiles. Putin is very fond of them. Of course, it did not have a nuclear warhead. Uh, it was a conventional warhead, but there's been a lot of talk about uh, hypersonic missiles. And this, there's no particular reason why they needed to use this missile other than to demonstrate that they have it and that they can up their game if they want to. And of course they can. As I see right now, there is no positive outcome for Putin. It's been a failure from day one. Uh, now he needs to figure out what to do, whether to withdraw with a negative outcome or to proceed also with a negative outcome, but he definitely needs to sort this out. And there is a risk, of course, that when faced with uh, multiple different, uh, difficult uh, alternatives, he will simply proceed to Kiev and he will use whatever uh, military power is needed to do so. And, and that would be, of course, a, a real tragedy. The consequences, I suspect, will be immense. Um, and, of course, we're still not fully understanding what the consequences will be. But I see a world in which Eastern Europe will now break free from Russia. So this is a failure on part of Russia, absolutely. I, I don't see any positive outcome for Putin, as I said. So in the same way that 1989 marked the year when Central Europe finally managed to sort of uh, get free from the Soviet Union, 2022 will be the beginning of the process whereby Eastern Europe will finally free itself from Russia. And so we should prepare for this and we should have a strategic focus on how to deal with these states, Ukraine, uh, Moldova, Georgia, Belarus even. Um, we should expect, of course, that if uh, the crisis really hits Russia, then Belarusian President Alexander Lukashenko will also feel this. So it would be very interesting to watch Belarus also. But we should prepare for this. We should prepare for the fact that uh, uh, Eastern Europe will finally be cut free from Russia. And, uh, and, and we need to have a strategic plan for this. And this includes uh, a conversation about European Union uh, membership and a conversation perhaps also about NATO membership. And then we should prepare ourselves for a, a Russia that is also quite different. It's already changing now. It changed over the weekend. It changed last week. So as I said, on 24th of uh, February, the Russians woke up to a new Russia. It's a Russia that is showing its sort of near-imperialist face. But what we're seeing now over the past week, of course, is a Russia that is turning inwards. It's becoming more authoritarian, even more authoritarian. It is displaying really clear fascist uh, elements. Uh, Putin now speaks about uh, blood and steel and expansion, and he speaks about a historical mission for Russia, uh, regardless almost of the cost. So it's a, it's a Russia that is changing. And we should expect, uh, prepare for a Russia that is more inward-looking, that is more fearful, a Russia that may be more aggressive in certain ways, even if it has fewer capabilities to, uh, to actually uh, exert its influence with. And we should also expect a Russia that will be in a way unstable. So we will see uh, political elites that are very fearful and they are sort of jockeying for position, um, trying to figure out what will happen. Will someone try to get rid of Putin or will we all just walk in sync behind him until something happens? But it's, it's a Russia that is changing even now uh, and has changed over this past week quite dramatically. And then, of course, we should be ready for Russia that is weakened. So I suspect it will have fewer means with which to influence around the world, Africa, Middle East, Eastern Europe, perhaps it will focus on what is the most important thing, and that clearly is the former Soviet space. And then we should prepare also for Russia eventually uh, 
that may be so politically, economically, and militarily weakened that it will start to sort of fall apart at the fringes. So some of you will remember Russia in the, in the early 90s, breakaway regions in the, in, in the fringes of Russia, for instance, in Northern Caucasus or maybe even in the Far East. So maybe a Russia that is quite similar to the Russia we remembered uh, 30 years ago, only now, still of course with nuclear missiles and now even with hypersonic missiles, so we should get ready for that and, and also have a strategic focus on that. With that, I, s I will end and pass the floor to my colleagues, so thank you. Thank you, and our second speaker today uh, is uh, uh, Trina willemsen berling also senior researcher here at DIES, and Trina will speak on the Russian gas between energy security, climate security, and the war in Ukraine. She's an expert in security and energy infrastructure and on the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. Thank you, Robin. Am I supposed to be on here? Like this here? Yeah. So, good morning. I guess I'm going to talk about a strategy that was actually quite successful, Russia's gas strategy. The Ukraine war has shown us that we failed to understand that Russian gas exports to Europe came with an additional cost, the cost of dependence on a state that we no longer trust. This is no coincidence. It was a clear strategy from the Russian side. And today, gas has become a symbol of European misjudgment of Russian motives and potential actions. The Ukraine war hit us as a freight train in the question of gas. But where did it come from, this dependence? How did we get here? What few people know is that Russia has for long considered energy exports as part of the foreign policy toolbox. In 1994, Primakov, this was before he became prime minister, stated that because Russia lacked military strength, energy would have to be considered a weapon. We didn't get this. But historically, Russia started building long-distance gas pipes after the Second World War in the Soviet Union. At that time, it may have been just a matter of trade. But after the Cold War, this changed. Gas pipelines became indeed powerful tool in the foreign policy toolbox. Gazprom, that, that we all know now, became the first state-owned company in Russia after the Soviet Union collapsed. And they are responsible for all international gas exports today. Luckily, Putin, 20 years ago, put a close col collaborator in charge of Gazprom, and he still holds that seat today. So I guess you have a very close friend leading Gazprom, a close friend of Putin's. So whatever Gazprom does, Putin knows about. Maybe he even ordered it. Looking to Europe, in 2006, 80% of all Russian gas exports to Europe were transited through Ukraine. But the relationship between the two countries soured. It was turbulent. It was difficult. Gas was even shut off through Ukraine. Ukraine on the 1st of January 2006. They even filmed it and put it on TV to make sure that everybody knew that gas was being used as a weapon against Ukraine at the time. In Denmark, we didn't really think much of it. We did when this pipeline started showing up in the news media, the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. And actually, the Nord Stream 2 pipelines were part of the strategy to circumvent and evade the Ukraine. Ukraine had become too difficult for Russia, so why not go through the peaceful Baltic Sea instead? The first pipeline in blue here was agreed to by the Danish government as the first government in the Baltic Sea region at the time. Everybody else were actually reluctant or outright against it. But Denmark saw an option for trade, I guess. It started pumping 55 billion cubic meters of gas through to Germany in 2012. That's about a third of what Russia pumps, pumped into Euro Europe last year. And the second pipeline then, 
that was just supposed to be that next step, that next step that wouldn't go through Ukraine where it would be difficult. But suddenly it had become a political problem. When Crimea was annexed in 2014, well, we kind of understood that something had happened. Maybe it was no longer such a great idea to have a gas pipeline going through the Baltic Sea and into Germany that would then, when finished, have 110 billion cubic meters of gas transiting just through the peaceful Baltic Sea. Ukraine had long said this was a bad idea. Most of the countries here on the eastern side, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and Poland, have been yelling about energy security for a long time. In Denmark, we, we started caring mostly because, well, because of the US. Let's see if it will shift this one. What was at stake in Europe? Well, the US entered the gas market in 2019 as a net exporter because of liquefied natural gas. They were fracking away in the US and they started exporting it. And many in Europe saw the opposition to Nord Stream 2 as a way to sell more gas for the Americans. And in Denmark, we were pushed hard. This was informal diplomacy, but we were pushed hard to try and say no. Selling gas was probably part of the reason for the US, but security reasons actually weighed much heavier in that way. At the same time, countries like Germany considered gas trade with Russia as an economic issue. Whenever we said, should we reconsider Nord Stream? The answer from Merkel would be, no, 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 it's trade. Trade is good. It creates peaceful relations among nations. At least that was the official line. And what was behind that was, of course, that natural gas has, be given, has been given the role of bridge fuel towards the green transition. What would we do without natural gas? We are just about to face, even today facing, a climate crisis. And, well, Germany was hard hit by this. They were facing out coal. They needed the natural gas to replace the coal. And at the same time, they were phasing out nuclear energy. After the Fukushima accident, there was a fast decision in Germany to say no more nuclear energy. And natural gas had become the solution. At the same time, if you compare the German and the US line, in Germany there was still this feeling that we should also be strategically autonomous. Today that sounds a little bit odd. From whom? Well, today we would obviously say from Russia, but at the time it was actually from the US. Some of you will remember the old Europe, new Europe dividing line that went through NATO and Europe back from the Iraq war days when Germany and France resisted the, the American leadership. Their gas politics is, has also been um, colored by that, by that story. So, Seeing natural gas as a security issue has not played a central role for most countries in Europe. Some have even said outright that no, 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 it's dangerous to see this as a security issue. But maybe we should have. Because look how the iron fist has grabbed Europe. These are the pipelines going from Russia and into Europe. You can see the, the yellow one is under construction. Well, <laughs> no longer from I think it was 22nd of February. But this is, this is dependence. This is how it looks like. What do we do? You don't win a war when you're dependent on gas. You don't win it with gas politics. It's too slow. We put ourselves in this situation and we're locked right now in infrastructure that goes from east to west. Nevertheless, the EU Commission has answered we need to cut down Russian gas by two-thirds by New Year. Great. Okay. Sorry, but that's going to be really, really difficult. And if we're going to do it, we might make the wrong decisions. Today, we import around 40% of our gas from Russia. Our infrastructure is completely dependent on it. It kind of, if I had a a more detailed map, you would then see all the pipes that connect so all the Russian gas can flow through the system 
If we cut that off, we're all going to feel it. Infrastructure takes time. And even though the EU wants to replace gas with green, renewable energy, we are actually risking this, this solution that will always first come to mind for energy people, finding new gas. Let's go and find new gas somewhere else. The green solutions will have a hard time. At the same time, I just wanted to say also that Ukraine and Moldova will actually also be hit if we decide to shut down gas flows because they're right there in the middle. So the gut reaction, replacing gas with gas, it sounds really, really stupid. But sadly and predictably, the first reaction has actually been to look for gas elsewhere. Qatar, Saudi Arabia, they will be our new friends. We have seen attempts to buy all liquefied natural gas available on the global market to try and get the, instead of going through the pipelines, getting them in through some of these LNG terminals. Only the blue ones are operational. The blue and, and orange ones are operational and under expansion, or at least it's planned. The green ones, only a few, are under construction. And then the fantasy, all of these lovely LNG terminals that we will build, the orange ones. That's the EU plan and strategy right now. Sadly, even with this expansion, this massive expansion of infrastructure, we will not have enough gas. We don't have the system that will be able to send this gas through to Europe. We have no connections, for instance, from Spain to France of any, any, uh, any size that is even just remotely uh, similar to what comes in from Russia. But still, this has been the first answer. And in Denmark, we've also had discussions about whether to look in the North Sea. Let's go and find those gas wells. We know they're there. It will only take us three to four years to open them. And then we will just build a little bit of infrastructure and we will have more gas. And it's from us, we're friends. We can send this to Europe. But infrastructure stays. And we have another threat on our hands. Because we now all know that energy security is real security today. Just three months ago, people would ask me why I was in the briefing with the, with the Ministry of Defense talking about gas. I don't think I'll have to explain that any longer. But there is no quick fix out of this. And what we're facing is actually everybody has to be involved. We have to take responsibility to change the situation even at the individual level. That's why the International Energy Agency has sent out 10 points where we all contribute. Because what's the bigger threat here? We didn't see the gas, gas threat coming. It's here. But while we think of ways out of the gas threat, we mustn't forget that climate security is also real security. So if we make the wrong decisions now, in a frenzy trying to cut off Russian gas, we will be looking for those LNG portals. We will be sweeping the market for liquefied natural gas globally, setting back other people's green transition. But this is, this is how energy politics work if we don't think, especially when energy ends up in the high politics of security with the war logic. We will make the wrong decisions. And that will be to replace fossil with fossil. And all the, all the while, we have that bigger threat underneath it all, the climate threat that we will most likely forget in these months and years to come. Thank you. Uh, our third speaker in this session is uh, Thomas Gamatov-Tansen.
uh, as Christian said, uh, no longer at DEES, but we count him as one of our own. Thomas is professor with special responsibilities at the Faculty of Law at the University of Copenhagen. He will speak on why mobility matters in the Ukrainian refugee response, and he is an expert on Nordic and international refugee and migration law and mobility regulation. Hello. Otherwise, hello? Yeah, that's better. Fantastic. So many thanks for the introduction. I've been asked to say a bit about the refugee and displacement dimension to this crisis. Um, as you all know by now, uh, we are facing a historic refugee and displacement crisis. Ten million people displaced, more people pretty much every day, uh, three and a half of million of which are refugees. Um, but I think it's also important to underline that we're also witnessing a, so far at least, fairly historic and unprecedented political response, at least when we compare to sort of newer European history in this area. So I'll try to say a little bit about why that is and what we can expect. So just to start with what's happening right now. Um, as many of you were aware, Denmark um, implemented and, and um, adopted a special law for Ukrainian refugees last week, a law which in its wording and content very closely resembles what we've seen at the EU level, namely activating an all directive, uh, the so-called temporary protection directive, uh, which was uh, adopted in, 20, uh, in 2001, but never actually used before. So, so this is also, in that sense, historic. It's furthermore historic in the sense that it was unanimously uh, adopted to implement it, which is really surprising if you know anything about how EU asylum and migration policy negotiations have been going on for the last few decades. Um, the content of this directive, and, and by, by extension also the Danish law, is of course that you give immediate recognition to Ukrainian refugees. Uh, it prevents, you could say, from a state perspective, the delays and overburdening of administrative systems such as the asylum authorities. I mean, if you look back to 2015, we saw that in, in many countries, the processing times for refugee applications spiked severely in Sweden. Asylum processing was well above one year, if you counted both instances. So, so this is sort of attractive in that sense from the perspective of member states. But it also means from the perspective of refugees that you grant refugees much faster access to things like the labor market, to education, schooling, housing, etc. Um, it's not quite the same rights package as you would get under the ordinary EU asylum system, or indeed the Danish. Um, but, but it provides, you can say, the more immediate rights very, very quickly, and in that sense might be attractive. What's also very important as part of this directive and system is that it provides for, and was intended to provide for, a different type of responsibility sharing between the member states. Uh, it basically means that, uh, and I'll come back to that in more detail, that refugees will have more easy access to move between the member states, and that you uh, are trying to sort of match, in a sense, uh, the capacity of member states, where member states can opt in and sort of uh, also uh, positively sort of volunteer to host and welcome more refugees than have immediately arrived. So there's a kind of double voluntariness standard although, as, as I'll come back to, a match between sort of refugee preferences and states' preferences un is not a guaranteed thing. Because it's a directive, it also means that it's not necessarily implemented in the same way across member states. We already see that now in terms of different member states having different definitions in terms of exactly who's included, how to do this on a practical basis. And as I'll also come back to, there is an entanglement here between different sets of rules. Um, this a special law and the directive for refugees from Ukraine operates in very close connection with things like mobility law, the visa laws for Ukrainian citizens, the Schengen rules guiding the external borders of the EU. 
So why is this happening now? Why it hasn't it happened for the last 20 years, for instance, in the context of 2015? Well, the first argument is probably that we're talking about a different speed and size of displacement, even compared to 2015. With 10 million displaced and 3.5 million refugees, we're now seeing a number which is almost three times as large if you look at the refugee situation than the number of asylum seekers arriving in Europe in 2015 throughout the year. I mean, just to give you a comparison, Poland alone received more refugees through the, the first two weeks of the invasion than all of the EU did throughout the entire year's history. So the temporary protection was designed exactly for this type of situation. In that sense, you might think that it's a rational choice to, to implement it now. Although it doesn't really explain why it hasn't similarly been used earlier um, for these sort of purposes. A second argument could be the legal context. Um, there has been a tendency also in Danish public debates to argue that, well, the only reason why we need a special law in Denmark is because uh, the Ukrainian, the, the ordinary Danish asylum uh, rules have become so restrictive that they're not guaranteed to provide asylum for the Ukrainian refugees. That's not entirely correct, at least not from a historical perspective, because fundamentally there's never been a general basis for conflict refugees to obtain asylum. It, there's never been a period where you could be absolutely certain that a group like what we're seeing now would all receive asylum. Many would probably do so, some under the Refugee Convention, some under subsidiary uh, protection instruments. And there has been a, a, an expansion of those rules also at the implement level of international law, but many would still say that the degree of conflict and how it affects the civilian population is not necessarily at the threshold where what we saw in Syria at the height of the civil war, uh, that everybody should be granted and are entitled to asylum based on international human rights law. So this brings us on to, you could say, the, the political context. And I think this has already been touched upon quite nicely by Fleming and others. I mean, uh, there is a, I think, quite unique geopolitical situation uh, underpinning this refugee crisis. And at least historically, we know from similar situations, especially if you go back to the Cold War, there's been a larger willingness to implement either special laws uh, or more expansive interpretations of asylum rules in contexts like this. We saw that during the Hungarian crisis in regard to the Balkan refugees, but also in regard to refugee crisis from further away from Europe, such as the Indo-Chinese refugees from Vietnam, where you had a global resettlement program involving almost all Western countries. And it speaks to, you could say, a political reality in which receiving refugees uh, is also a political signaling tool, both domestically and internationally as a matter of foreign policy, where receiving refugees is tantamount to scoring ideological points, especially in a situation where you cannot more directly enter into a conflict. There is lots of historical precedent for that, and, and you could, s of course, discuss that and whether it's fair vis-a-vis -vis other uh, refugee uh, flows, but, but that seems to be sort of the historical alignment. There's, of course, also an EU political dimension to this. I, I think a lot of member states may have been pushed to implement the Temporary Protection Directive simply because of the experience from 2015 still lingering. And what we saw in 2015 was basically a collapse of collaboration because the trust in, in the common EU rules didn't uh, pan out and because there was no effective agreement on, you can say, more top-down redistribution models. So that may also be a factor in, in, in this regard. And then lastly, of course, you could point to, and, and this has been the headline for, for my talk today, that there is this entanglement between other rights and other legal regimes. Most important of these, I think, is the visa liberalization scheme. So Ukrainian refugees and Ukrainian nationals are the first major refugee group uh, in, in sort of the last two decades that have had visa-free access to Europe, meaning that they can enter the Schengen area and have the right to move about and stay there for up to 90 days. So this is really unprecedented in terms of upending the kind of existing logic of how the EU has organized its migration and asylum policy. I, it, it means that refugees, for the first time in a very long time, have safe and legal access to come in in terms of 
ba basically bypassing the regimes of migration control and deterrence that has been characterizing and sort of serving as the guiding political paradigm for um, EU's migration policy in this area for several decades. It also means that they're not obliged to immediately apply for asylum. Uh, they have that 90-day window. It may mean that uh, a proportion of those arriving uh, don't necessarily uh, see themselves as applying for asylum under this temporary protection directive or indeed the Danish special law. They may instead pursue other types of residence permits, for instance, based on labor rights. There's been large uh, labor migrant diasporas in several European countries also prior to the invasion. We now see some universities around Europe trying to open up uh, student places specifically targeting Ukrainians. So in that sense, you can also say that's putting maybe a little bit top, uh, lighting a little bit the top pressure of also the refugee uh, um situation. Secondly, and, and I think this is absolutely essential, it enables this, as I mentioned, travel between the member states. And what's maybe more surprising um, is that when the EU member states implemented the Temporary Protection Directive, they did so with a special condition not to apply so the so-called Article 11, meaning that even after people get refugee status under this temporary uh, pr temporary protection status under the directive, they are still enabled to move around and between the member states. So this is not a, a sort of something that you would necessarily have to do when implementing the temporary protection. So again, it shows a different degree of willingness to enable mobility for refugees. And in this case, I think it also provides for a quite unique, you could say, political and socioeconomic experiment. Uh, in the first sense, of course, because of this legal access to the EU member states, it bypasses this political paradigm which has guided EU migration policy for at least 30 years. Um, secondly, because the mobility right upends the kind of top-down logic, which has similarly characterized EU asylum policy since the 1990s. As many of you will know, under ordinary rules, the Dublin system would apply, meaning that as a starting point, asylum seekers would be required to apply for asylum in the first member states they arrived in or got registered in. And in general, mobility between the member states would be very, very difficult to achieve. Over the last 10 years, the EU has, in some instances, especially in connection with the 2015 Syrian refugee crisis, tried to make some ad hoc attempts towards what you could call more top-down redistribution mechanisms of negotiating quotas based on GMP, uh, GDP, um, uh, population size, uh, labor market uh, constraints, etc. All that has been fairly unsuccessful. What we see right now is, you could say, a um, rather different, I, I might even say radically different approach to responsibility sharing in the sense that, A, it harnesses refugees' own preferences, something that's never been taken into account in the way that we've organized asylum and migration policy for the last 30 years, meaning that refugees have the opportunity to move to countries where they might have family, networks, or see themselves as having better job opportunities. And secondly, that it also changes, you could say, the, 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 uh, the logic around the Dublin system, which entices states to basically either try and close their borders, and that's what we saw in 2015, not just at the external borders, but also a reintroduction of border controls all the way up through Europe or for frontline states not to register or provide asylum, simply wave on uh, a refugees if they feel that they're being um, experienced with, with too large numbers. So, so far at least, we haven't seen so much of that, although there are some indications that, for instance, Hungary uh, is, again, interpreting the rules somewhat differently, uh, more narrowly applying, for instance, the, the visa rules that you cannot enter from, for instance, Romania, where there's a Schengen border between Romania and, and Hungary without a biometric passport, which could be seen as sort of attempts to sort of like collapse back into that logic. But on the large, I think we're still seeing sort of a logic of fairly openness. Many states have actively supported also mobility in terms of providing free public transportation.
And so far, we haven't seen this sort of cascade of border closures that we saw in 2015. So where will all this lead us? Well, I think, first and foremost, it will, I think, allow the EU member states and the EU at large to harvest a set of experiences uh, that are radically different from anything we've seen in the last few decades in terms of what it means to have fast recognition of asylum seekers as refugees, what it means to provide these internal mobility opportunities, uh, first and foremost, of course, for integration, for uh, self-reliance of refugees, but also politically in terms of maybe rekindling a much-needed trust in, in, in EU collaboration in this area. And it's, of course, significant that some of the most reluctant states uh, from a within the kind of e EU asylum and migration policy family has been exactly some of the states now experience very large refugee numbers. But of course, as any experiment, there's also a risk that it might fail. And I, I would say that if we are to sort of gauge the, the, the likelihood of success or failure, it's very important to look out for three things in the coming months. First, of course, is the degree of solidarity, and you could say hands-on solidarity, in terms of money, uh, expertise, equipment, and also willingness to ensure relocation within, uh, between, on the one hand, the eastern states now most affected and hosting the vast majority of refugees, in particular Poland, uh, but also other states in the region, uh, and the rest of the EU bloc. Secondly, there's no guarantee that this sort of more bottom-up or spontaneous redistribution model will provide uh, a balanced result. We may well st see that some countries will experience very high numbers, both among the front states, but also some secondary states. So it raises the issue of how to deal with that and, and what to do. Um, probably, you and, and that's what the Temporary Protection Directive uh, foresees, you could do uh, more politically open-ended uh, and voluntary deals in terms of arguing that you could accept then some of these refugees and try and do this double voluntary matching system. Um, but if it happens that you have very large concentrations, you may again see that some states will simply opt out of this model or try to break with it. Lastly, I think the temporary nature of this scheme uh, is, is an important factor. Under the directive, refugees get an initial residence permit of one year. That can be extended up to three years. Under the Danish rules, it's two years. Um, and the big question, of course, is whether this refugee crisis will have been at least partially resolved by that time. Uh, if we do imagine a scenario where there's still an extensive protection need in two or three years' time, well, the lesson again from previous applications of, you could say, more nationally based temporary protection models is that you're basically running the risk of pushing much harder decisions in front of you in terms of then needing to take decisions, either making it possible, and it is actually legally possible to apply through the ordinary asylum channels, but again, there's no guarantee that all the Ukrainian refugees will be entitled to status, or making then an extension of this sort of more ad hoc or special types of legislation. Many thanks. Uh, thank you very much. Um, the observant listener would notice we've gone slightly over time, uh, but we'll try to put a little more uh, uh, cushion in our Q&A so we have at least 20 minutes. So again, <coughs> Please uh, keep your questions brief, introduce yourself and your affiliation. And Jan, who is our communication uh, colleague, will be going around with the microphone. Hello, uh, and thank you very much for this event. I'm uh, Uffe Wiedkjær from uh, Europe Dialogue and Danish UN Association. I would just like uh, to ask uh, for a comment. Uh, Christian, you were talking about how to understand this situation. And uh, for example, uh, Russia is talking about genocide or killing of 
Russian people in eastern Ukraine. And uh, this week in Danish news, there was an interview with a Russian man from living in Estonia and talking about killing of Russians in Odessa. So, so do you have a comment to this uh, uh, view from from uh, Russian side, uh, for example, in eastern Ukraine? Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, thank you for this. Uh, as concerns uh, Russian claims about. Uh, genocide least in Ukraine of course they have been uh, they have been rejected they've been rejected also by uh, by the UN uh, by S Secretary General of the United Nations has also rejected it and said there is no basis for that and what I usually say is that since we've had war in eastern Ukraine for eight years of course conditions are difficult they are difficult on either side of uh, the border but there is no genocide and um, it's been ramped up, of course. You see it also as a political tool in Russia. So famously, Putin said in an interview press conference in December that what, uh, what is happening in eastern Ukraine is sort of genocide, but we are not there yet. I hope you heard the first part of, uh, of my answer, which is that there is no genocide in eastern Europe. So what we saw famously in December is that uh, Russian President Putin said that what is happening in Eastern Europe, uh, Eastern Ukraine is close to genocide, but we're not there yet. And that's a political tool, of course. It, it's a way for him to sort of uh, to, uh, to escalate if later he wants to. And he did this, of course, when he was hosting meeting with German Chancellor Olaf Scholz when he said what is happening in Eastern Ukraine is genocide. That's it. And so it's it's a it's in a way it's it's a, it's an escalation tool and it's a way to pave the way for what happened later, and when you follow Russian media as I do, you will see that it has been increasing uh, for some time. So they they escalate and they de-escalate in terms of this. Now concerning the interview in on on Radio Denmark, I really think you shouldn't too put too much emphasis on this. I appeared in the same uh, TV, um, in the same news show. And it was clear to me that uh, the uh, correspondent of Radio Denmark had found someone who was sort of interesting for television consumption, but not a particularly trustworthy or interesting voice. So be careful with uh, with that. So if you have a a, a Russian, uh, s ethnic Russian, pro-Russian, whatever the term that we might want to use, living in Estonia, claiming that something is happening in southern Ukraine, you should be careful with that. So and and that may be a reminder also to Radio Denmark and others to be careful with the way that they treat it. Thank you. I am uh, Jan Rimau and I am a retired psychologist. I want to ask what do you think are the requisites for a, uh, for a solution, for a negotiated solution of this conflict? What shall we look for and what could be uh, proposed, what, what could be done to get to that end? Well, we hear that negotiations are taking place, and we know, of course, that there have been several rounds of negotiations. So already on day two of this war, the Russians indicated their willingness to negotiate. And I've generally interpreted this as a sign of weakness in the sense that the military campaign is not unfolding as planned. And so we had a, f a, a number of rounds, and then we had uh, direct negotiations between the, the foreign ministers, and negotiations continue. The way that I see Russian demands are that they are sort of listed in order of, of relevance and importance. Number one would be the recognition of Crimea as part of Russia. Uh, Crimea, of course, is the Ukrainian peninsula that was annexed by Russia in March 2014. The second would be the recognition of the two so-called secessionist areas, People's Republics in eastern Ukraine, um, as sovereign states. And it's important for you to, for all of us to remember that when Putin recognized these two areas as sovereign states, he recognized them not within the borders of the so-called People's Republics, but within the borders of the two uh, Ukrainian regions that carry the same name. So 
in a sense a wider territory. And what he did is that he gave the green light for these areas, for these for the separatists to conquer more territory. So that would be number two, the recognition that these two are sovereign states, following which, probably the next day, they would be incorporated into Russia. So there would be a referendum in these two states and they would ask to be incorporated into Russia and Russia would then simply take them over. Number three would be a kind of demilitarization of Ukraine, possibly a neutral status as part of that. And number four would be denazification of Ukraine. And denazification, of course, is, is a strange term and it's something that Putin used in a way to justify the invasion. It's also interesting from a political perspective because sometimes politicians like to to use these tools in order to give themselves legitimacy, but by doing so, he may also block his own emergency exit. It's difficult for him now suddenly to negotiate with the alleged Nazis. Um, so that has sort of disappeared from, from Russian public debate. Now there's much more focus on some of the other issues, in particular demilitarization and a neutral status. As I said, I don't really see a positive outcome for, for Putin even if he gets all on his on his on his wish list, he will still be faced with massive sanctions. And Russia, of course, is a pariah state uh, in Europe now. It it has put itself outside of uh, of, of of the European family, and so um, negotiations may drag on. Um, he may realize that he needs to do a kind of compromise. Uh, but my interpretation of the first rounds of negotiations have been that the two sides were looking each other, uh, looking at each other in order to sort of assess whether the other side is ready to give in. So uh, Ukrainians, of course, are under immense pressure, but the Russians are also under pressure, and they're under pressure because of casualties in Ukraine, much, much higher than they expected, much, much higher, and because of uh, the economic sanctions. Uh, and they already have, a, have an impact on the Russian economy. And, and the Russian authorities keep uh, sort of telling us and the domestic public that uh, the Russian economy will not collapse, which is a clear sign that it may actually collapse. Uh, so, uh, so they are also under very heavy pressure. And uh, so, but negotiations are, of course, possi possible and positive. And the most recent talks are of negotiations either in Turkey or maybe in Israel. Okay, I'm going to take three questions, but of course, following up on this one, is curious whether the whole discussion of economic sanctions and energy politics is part of this discussion of a negotiation. But meanwhile, we'll take uh, three questions in a row, uh, first at the back. Thanks so much, Esther Kedigo Peterson. I'm Thomas's colleague at the Faculty of Law, uh, and I work uh, on international law. And I'm wondering, um, because as, as far as I can tell, uh, the genocide argument has sort of been pulled back a little bit, and 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 then uh, r Putin is is uh, rather focusing on self-defense arguments, preemptive self-defense, and it's not quite clear whether it's the preemptive self-defense of Russia or the 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 two um, or Lugansk or Donetsk or, or but but and and of course the genocide argument gave the ICJ uh, a way in um, to 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 deal with this case. So I'm just wondering overall, does it make any impression on? perhaps not Putin, but at least then the Russian people that, 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 the, that Russia cl quite clearly lost at the ICJ last week. And, uh, and, and overall, is, is all of these international law-related arguments, are they just political, or, or, or does the international legal order, in fact, have a role to play in this case? And there was a... Uh, no, here. You had your hand up. Hello. <coughs> um, I'm afraid this question is a, a, a again addressed at planning. My name is Noel Parker, and I'm a emeritus at the Institute of uh, Political Science. Um, uh, you, uh, we, the problem of Russia, Russia post empire. Um, we probably need to see this not in the terms that Europeans normally see it, uh, but in the terms of um, world historian uh, history. That's the Europeans, European empires were unique in the, f in the sense that they did spread across the oceans. But it's very unusual in, in terms of history. Uh, over the course of history, there have been many, many empires which have spread in their, in their area. So this widens the field. 
of potential empires and post-empires. Uh, so uh, now I'm thinking of what empires have we had in the past which have been <coughs> kind of settled, resolved in some, some way. Um, I would regard the Danish Empire as an instance, the Swedish Empire as an instance, um, possibly the German Empire, which spread uh, um, contingently, uh, uh, contiguously. Um, no, you have to keep this brief. Okay, We're running so out of time. This, is the, this is the field. So um, post-imperial feelings are the problem. Uh, and there are, there are post-imperial feelings in many countries. So what, how can we deal with the problem of Russia in this context? Right. And there was one more question here before we open it up to our speakers. Good morning and thank you. My name is Anna Anderson and I work at the Danish Foreign Service. I would like the panelists to develop a bit on the way in which you see that uh, Russia be handled going forward. We've talked a lot about the issues now and the problems that we're facing, but not so much on the strategies and methods that the international community can use going forward to handle this situation. Thank you. And there was actually one more <laughs> woman right there. We'll take the fourth question. Yes. Thank you. My name is Christina Grigoraki. I'm from KU, uh, Department of Political Science. And I was just wondering, you mentioned that you think Russia will come out of this very weakened. So what are your thoughts on the future of NATO, for instance? Okay, but before I turn it over to our speakers, I just want to add to a couple of the questions. First of all, Trina, if you could uh, respond to my question about energy security in terms of negotiation, is that a relevant factor? And Thomas, in terms of your colleague's question about genocide, I can mention I heard, thanks to Jan, a uh, podcast interviewing t uh, Timothy Schneider where the issue of genocide was also brought to the fore, and he said, in fact, of course, this is uh, <laughs> has no bearing, but a uh, to destroy a, a, a people, to destroy a culture, to destroy a language, can be considered genocide. So in terms of the mobility issue, is there some uh, way of, is that a relevant factor? So why don't we uh, actually start with you, Thomas, and then Trina, and then uh, Fleming. Many thanks. Uh, in terms of the genocide question, I, I think the, the key part of Astrid's question was probably more on the sort of the political response side. So I can maybe just sort of address that first part here. So in essence, we have the International Court of Justice coming down with a judgment, which, I mean, I went further, I think, and if you want to read more about it, Astra has actually written an excellent uh, piece on this. You can find on the Infono website. Um, um, they went further in terms of pushing this argument that many had believed. So, so from a legal standpoint, it's not entirely trifle. It, it's not simply a, a political argument that's been thrown around. Of course, again, as a Security Council member, uh, Russia won't, uh, unsurprisingly, uh, follow up on, on the judgment. But, but it, it is an important part of, of the, the kind of legal construction around the war in this regard. In terms of the, 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 the question from down here, in terms of elaborating on, on where Russia sits in this, I think from a refugee and mobility perspective, I think it's firstly important to maybe also think about, we've talked so much, and I made the same fallacy of only addressing the Ukrainian refugees, but we should, of course, remind ourselves also that there may also be Russian minorities uh, facing persecution as, opposed as part of this conflict. Um, it's going to be very important, I think, also in terms of sending a signal uh, to uh, Russia and, and then also part, I suppose, conflict resolution that we don't create an undue double standard where uh, Russian-minded citizens of Ukraine are treated vastly different as part of refugee flows. Similarly, it's maybe also important to remind ourselves that at least during the Crimean War, uh, Russia was actually the largest refugee-hosting country 
uh, it was not in Europe. The vast uh, majority of, of refugees that weren't internally displaced were actually displaced towards Russia. We don't really have uh, solid numbers for displacement in, uh, towards Russia. Uh, it looks like it's much, much smaller this time, and, and justifiably so. But, but it, it is interesting also from an international perspective to be mindful that there could be uh, smaller groups of, of refugees also in that direction. Yes, thank you. Am I on? Yeah, I think so. So will energy play a role in, in peace negotiations? Well, on the morning of the invasion, Gazprom tweeted that gas would flow without interruption into Europe. Don't worry. Um, at the time, it seemed like a signal to Europe saying, don't get into this, don't get involved. We've got you, right? We've got your backs. You need our gas. But throughout the crisis now, we've seen actually areas where Ukrainian pipes, gas pipes, have probably been destroyed or damaged or to some extent must have created problems for the gas flow. And therefore, the next tweets and the next press conferences restating this seem more and more like panic. Um, you know, like Fleming said, more and more signs of weakness where in the beginning they seemed like signs of power. So can gas and gas infrastructure become part of the negotiations? Maybe, but right now the EU is on a track to actually cut themselves off from using um, the power of receiving Russian gas by cutting down by two thirds by New Year. So right now it seems as if the EU is just also panicking, trying to get out of this iron fist that I showed you on the map, trying to, to break free and thereby also to some extent actually breaking um, a route of communication that might have been then reinstalled at a later stage. So, so the, the EU is not playing this game very well at the moment. And I think maybe also to your question, how do we solve this going forward? Well, if we're severing all ties to Russia right now because we're in a panic situation, this is a crisis, we might regret it later. It might be that actually for some, you know, for us right now, very mysterious reason, gas could indeed become a good, a tradable good that, that Europe and Russia might be able to agree on for the, you know, for the extent of time that we planned it in our green transition, but not with new infrastructures on in Spain and everywhere else, because that's going to log us for 50 years. So, so it it will play a role, but but it won't it won't play a decisive role. And right now, we don't we don't know the weapon so well in Europe. We actually misjudge it continuously. And I know Fleming, you've been bombarded with questions, but I'm going to ask you to keep it to down to what you can say in two minutes as sure. we're over time. But yeah. of course, many of you have also registered for the uh, seminar that begins at noon, where Fleming will have. Thank you. On. Yeah. Well, just very briefly on on the genocide issue. When I look at Russian media, it's clear that it has sort of been pushed into the background. It doesn't figure as prominently as it did at the beginning of the war and in the lead up to the war. Now there is talk every day in Russian media, for instance, on alleged production by Ukraine of nuclear, biological, and chemical weapons, and that Russia has to intervene in order to prevent that. So it's also this kind of preemptive uh, argument. So different arguments are put forward, and, and it reflects in a way what we've grown accustomed to with uh, Russian sort of information operations, disinformation operations, uh, just throwing out a lot of different narratives, including from the field of, of uh, lawfare, uh, using legal arguments uh, in, in different ways, different shapes and so on, in order to, to try to legitimize an action. On, on the post, um, on the near imperialist and post-colonialist, um, super interesting, of course. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, if Russia could end up uh, being like a new Sweden, that would be perfect, of course, and, and seeing its former colonies in this particular way. But it's it really is something which has become more prominent in Russian political thinking. And some of you will know also that uh, references to the Soviet Union were put into the constitution with the constitutional amendments in 2020. So uh, Russia is now the, the, the official uh, successor state uh, to the Soviet Union and, and Russia has to protect the historical legacy. Uh, 
of, uh, of the Soviet Union. So it has a new status. Russia has a very painful relationship with its past. And once we get to the other side of all of this, I think we will need from our side also to insist that the Russians take a deep breath and really handle this in a way that we've seen handled really well elsewhere, for instance, in Germany following the end of the Second World War. So they need to return to Stalinism. They need to, re to re revisit some of this. What was ha what happened uh, during the totalitarian and and authorita uh, authoritarian times, including its its imperialist past, and and to to look at that. Just finally on NATO, as I said in in my brief presentation, um, it, it a really odd decision based on various factors. But it's even if it's rational, and it is rational. Often we know that when you when you when you act in a rational way, you don't always get the outcome that you're looking for. And Putin, in quite paradoxical ways, have actually managed to strengthen NATO. So NATO now has a much stronger sense of purpose than it did just a few weeks ago, which is quite interesting and, of course, paradoxical. But when we look at it across the board, it seems that this mom this the uh, the decision to invade Ukraine was of such a momentous character. Momental, uh, monumental uh, character that it really changes so many things, including also NATO, of course, and Russia's relationship with NATO. So NATO has a stronger sense of purpose now, uh, and it's something that NATO will carry forward also. Thank you very much. We're now going to have a changing of the guard, and our th second round of speakers will come. I'll turn the floor over to Manny Krohn, my colleague uh, in collaborating the seminar. And uh, we have gone 10 minutes over in the first session, but believe me, there's ample time to take it up at the end, so we will not uh, jeopardize the time in the second session. Okay, does this work? Yes, apparently. Okay, we'll move straight on with the second part of, of this seminar, and we have a new lineup of senior researchers, all from DIES. We have Vibeke Skov Chalve, Luke Pady, and Rens van Münster. And in this second part of the seminar, we are going to look a bit more on the global and international ramifications and implications of the ongoing war. We'll talk about China, we'll talk about India, we'll talk about the US, but we'll start out with a topic that quite seriously has become much more relevant over the last month, namely the nuclear threat. And I'm very happy to be able to introduce our first speaker, uh, Rens van Münster, senior researcher Rens van Münster, who's been working on precisely this topic on global politics, the nuclear threat, and what that means for the way that we wage war. Um, and the title of your talk today, Rens, is The Ukraine War and this Prospect of Nuclear War. So, please. Okay, I was told to speak. Yes, okay. Um, thank you, Manny, for that introduction. Um, after a long period in which people showed quite little interest in nuclear weapons, it's now again uh, in all of our minds. And um, just a few days, ag days ago, I spoke to a journalist from the radio, and you know, they told me to get a lot of questions from listeners who are actually afraid about nuclear war and want to know if their fears are uh, rational and whether it's more dangerous than the Cold War. And she so wanted my response to that. And um, while I do not want to overstate the risk of nuclear war, I'm also not sure I can offer much comfort to such anxieties. Um, so I think my talk will kind of, um, that will kind of be kind of the mood of my talk today, I think. Um, we all of course know why nuclear weapons are again in, our in, our in the back of our minds or in the front of our minds now. It's a Russian invasion of Ukraine, and ever since Putin ordered the nuclear um, uh, Russia's nuclear forces to be put on special alert three days into the conflict, uh, 
There has been growing speculation about whether this conflict, now still confined to Ukraine, could kind of spill over or escalate into an exchange of tactical, maybe even strategic nuclear weapons. Um, most experts, and I think I'm, uh, I'm, I'm not saying I'm one of them, but I think I agree with them, is that nuclear escalation is unlikely but not impossible. And for that reason has to be taken very seriously. Okay. And I think so far the decisions by NATO reflect this view. Um, NATO member states have generally been careful not to get directly involved in the conflict and to not risk further escalation. And I'm going to give you a quote by NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg, I think which really uh, kind of distills this position that NATO is, is taking. And he says, and I quote, NATO is a defensive alliance, we are not part of this conflict, and we have a responsibility to ensure it does not escalate and spread beyond Ukraine. Because that would be even more devastating and more dangerous. NATO is not seeking a war with Russia. And of course, the example we all know in, in which we really see this attitude crystallized is the decision to not establish a non-flight so, uh, a non-fly zone o uh, over Ukrainian airspace, for example. And we, we can talk a bit more about that later if you want to. At the same time, the risk of nuclear war remains a real possibility. Um, the UN Secretary General, um, Antonio Guterres, was the latest to convey such fears, to say that um, the once unthinkable prospect of nuclear war is now, again, within the realm of possibility. So I, I think I disagree with him. I think nuclear war has been in the realm of possible possibility ever since 1949, when uh, the Soviet Union acquired the atomic bomb. And um, even if we just look at recent history over the last decade or so, it is clear that the risk of nuclear war has been on the rise and definitely greater than zero. Okay, so I think the Ukraine war occurred within and intensified a situation that was already pervaded by a deep sense of uh, nuclear crisis. But it's of course clear that uh, the Ukraine conflict has made this crisis much more acute and urgent. Um, is that from water? For some reason I'm really nervous, I don't know why, <laughs> as you probably can hear. Um, against this broader background, now I would like to uh, briefly stress uh, four points, but I would like to start with, uh, with one point before I, I come to this, and that's really, I think we're all speculating now um, how, why, what kind of nuclear weapons could be used, by whom. Um, and it's very much important to keep in mind, I think, that n nuclear weapons have virtually no military utility. Okay? Um, and the use of nuclear weapons will have you know, grave humanitarian and, 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 and environmental consequences. So their purpose is to kill a lot of people, or rather to demonstrate the resolve to kill a lot of people, um, but have very little uh, military utility besides that. I think it's important to mention this in, ad in advance because um, I think it's this mic that really makes me nervous. Um, because there's a risk to kind of normalize our talk about these weapons when we start talking about how to use them, when to use them. And clearly, nuclear weapons are not like any other weapon, okay? Um, even tactical nuclear weapons, which are kind of smaller weapons intended for the use on the battlefield, remain immensely powerful, and there's no such thing as a small nuclear weapon. So I think that really has to be stated in advance. So the first thing I wanted to flag has to do with the idea of nuclear deterrence. And I've been getting a lot of questions about nuclear deterrence, what it is and how it works and whether it works. And I think it can be defined as any action that seeks to discourage another action by creating doubt about the consequences or fear about the consequences. Right, so if somebody would like to punch me in the face for some reason and they say that I'm uh, carrying a big gun, they would might think twice and not do it because they fear the consequences, right? So that's kind of how deterrence works, very basically. And I think it's possible to say two things about deterrence in the, in the context of this conflict. I think first it's very clear that Putin's threat to use nuclear weapons uh, is deterring the West from getting involved more out of a fear of escalation. 
Um, so nuclear weapons here offer Russia a cover to pursue a conventional war without having to worry too much about uh, the West getting involved. And what is true for Putin is of course for also true for other states that have nuclear weapons. And uh, in this sense, deterrence seems to work and to do its jobs. And um, the difficulty is, of course, that it allows Russia to wage a war that in all on all accounts is illegitimate and morally uh, reprehensible. And the question here, I think, that is uh, the difficult one going forward is, how long can you stand by? Are there any red lines? And I think we are getting closer to some idea of red lines with this talk about uh, Putin being a war criminal, questions of genocide being brought up. Um, people who think deterrence works and are uh, uh, think it's a good thing, they will point out that it will keep the war limited to Ukraine and certainly prevents further forms of suffering, right? So to them it may be a bad solution, but it's the best of bad solutions. And of course the billion dollar question I think on everybody's mind is now, is Putin also deterred by NATO's nuclear weapons? Or has he the ambition, the will and the power to escalate the conflict beyond Ukraine? And this is the second point I wanted to make about deterrence, and it really comes down to, uh, to one basic question. Do we believe that Putin knows the difference between a NATO member state and a non-member state? Um, or do we, as President Zelensky has tried to warn us, think that his ambi ambitious ambition stretches beyond Ukraine and that he is willing to risk nuclear escalation for those ambitions? Mm, I think the jury is still out on this question. And both sides can find some support for their positions. Reasons why Russia may not, at or at least not in the foreseeable future, attack member states is based on what's currently going on. Like he's invaded Georgia, he's invaded Crimea, and now Ukraine. But despite like the warlike rhetoric, he has so far refrained from the military attack of NATO states. Um, moreover, the West has been perhaps unexpectedly so united and may seem like an unwise time to test the resolve of the West, um, especially if Putin is interested in regime survival. Um, you do not want to risk a nuclear war, but given how the Ukraine war is unfolding, it seems very unlikely that a conventional war uh, is something that will benefit the Russians right now. Those that are less convinced that, um, you know, that that Putin will be deterred, they point at Kremlin rhetorics and Putin's dream and ideology of a larger Russia, what Fleming was talking about earlier. Um, you know, they would point out that Kremlin propagandists are openly discussing attacks on Sweden, Finland and the Baltic states on Russian TV. They will point at historical precedents, such as the invasion of Finland in 39. Um, and there are of course also arguments that Putin has simply gone mad and is now uncontrollable um, and that he will do whatever it takes to draw the West into a conflict in the hope of exposing cracks within the alliance. Um, to them, you know, Putin will not be deterred and must not be appeased. So, and this brings me to my second point, which is the fear that Putin may deliberately seek to escalate the conflict in the hope of forcing a political solution. So military experts call this escalating to de-escalate. So it can take many forms, but so far experts appear most concerned with the possibility of Putin using a tactical nuclear weapon on a, on a Ukrainian mili military target or somewhere else to demonstrate his resolve and his willingness to take this to the next level if no favorable political solution will be found. Now this would surely cross a red line. You know, it would end almost 80 years of taboo on the use of nu nuclear weapons. It will be a drastic and desperate act, I think. Um, it seems unlikely, but again, not impossible. And I think the one thing it does stress is the need to keep diplomacy going alongside the military effort, despite the clear illegitimacy and immorality of the war. Okay. So we'll have to ask, what is a political, political compromise to end this violence? If Putin decides to escalate to the nuclear level, the West faces a very difficult and dangerous catch-22. Either, you know, they and Ukraine accept his demands in order to prevent further escalation. This would stop the violence, but also send a signal that um, states can use 
atomic bombs to get their will without being punished. This will be the beginning of a new era in international politics. Or if they decide to respond, either by upping their conventional involvement in the war or by showing their own resolve by maybe detonating a strategic weapon somewhere, um, this will bring us into direct war with Russia and one or several steps closer to nuclear war. Uh, it would be kind of a scary lap into the unknown if that was to happen. So this is what I wanted to say about kind of the strategic aspects of the Ukrainian conflict now. And the third issue I wanted to very briefly uh, flag is that apart from nuclear war, we are now also dealing with a, a range of other difficult nuclear scenarios. Okay? One is that environmental cooperation with the Russians has come to a halt, which is kind of increasing fears about nuclear waste in the Arctic. And another one, the most urgent one, I think, is the, the risk of military attacks on and the occupation of nuclear power plants, which we have seen in uh, Zaporizhia. You know, and it's this risk that has led Danes to kind of massively buy iodine pills in health shops and in pharmacies over the last uh, week or so. And there are agreements that prohibit such attacks, but I think this war has shown that the weaponization of nuclear reactors is now a thing. Uh, so it's another way in which uh, energy politics has become security politics. And given that nuclear energy in the future is seen by many as part of uh, you know, the mix of solutions to climate change, I think this is a very serious risk we have to take forward in the future. And we can talk a little bit more about this in the Q&A if you want. And I wanted to end, and this is kind of my final, my fourth point, with a few observations about the future of nuclear disarmament. Um, and I think this future looks quite bleak. So when the world came close to nuclear war in 1962, after the Cuban Missile Crisis, the great powers realized that it was in their common interest to, to commit to nuclear arms control. So already a, a year later, in 1963, they signed the Limited Test Ban Treaty, which was the first nuclear arms control treaty, and also, I should say, the first environmental treaty, because it dealt with the question of radioactive fallout. But today I'm much less optimistic that the Ukraine war will be a catalyzer, a catalyzator for, for disarmament or arms control. Rather, I fear that it will worsen the already existing crisis in the uh, nuclear disarmament regime. So great powers, already before the Ukraine war, were investing heavily in new weapons that make the risk of nuclear war more likely, such as those hypersonic dual-use weapons we heard about earlier. Um, the US, for instance, because this is not just uh, Russia, is using $630 billion over the next 10 years uh, to modernize the nuclear weapons arsenal and to invest in new, uh, new weapons, new weaponry. And uh, at the same time, international agreements from the Cold War have either been um, abandoned, such as the INF Treaty, which was abandoned by uh, Trump in 2019, or hollowed out as this, uh, the Non-Proliferation Treaty, which is kind of virtually come to a standstill. Um, and I think since the Ukraine war, great power tensions have only increased and deepened the sense of mistrust and sus suspicion, not just between the US and Russia, but also between the US and China. At the same time, I think the way the war is going in Ukraine makes very clear to the Russians that they need nukes and cannot simply rely on their conventional forces. So I think it will be you know, very hard to, to agree in the future on, on disarmament uh, agreements. Um, I think the Russian uh, invasion also could also have a big impact on nuclear proliferation, and I think Iran is the test case here. The Vienna talks to, you know, to revive the 2015 Iran deal, which have been going on over the last, I think, two weeks or so, have now been paused because of Russian demands that uh, uh, Russian-Iranian trade will be exempted from the sanctions, um, which would be kind of a departure from, from kind of bringing the Ukraine conflict and the sanctions into the Iran deal. And it's unacceptable to the Americans. And uh, I mean, even I think if the Russians would, would not have these demands, I think it's, it's, it looks very unlikely, I think, that the Iran deal will happen uh, now. And uh, at least I think that more than ever we are now close to the Iranians may be also getting a nuclear capability, and the fear is also goes beyond uh, Iran, because we may be looking at a nuclearized Middle East, because after Iran, there's a fear that the Saudi Arabians might also want to have their bomb, which means that the Egyptians might want to get one, and so on, and so on. So I think 
Um, you know, also if you think Biden has two years left, um, Trump may come back in two years. He was not in favor of an Iran deal. Um, I think you know you do you do the math <laughs> if you are a country and you have given up nuclear weapons program and you see what happened to you like uh, Ukraine has uh, has now witnessed what Libya has witnessed. I think the calculation is that you probably uh, want nuclear weapons for your safety. And finally, in Europe, uh, I think we can expect renewed debates as to whether Europe should have its own nuclear deterrent force. This was already a little bit in the air, whether the Germans should take a more active role and share the French nuclear capability. I think this will become a discussion again. And um, another discussion is whether uh, Europe should be home to more American nuclear weapons. And it's a discussion we've been having already a little bit in Denmark, where especially the parties on the right uh, have shown some willingness to host uh, nuclear weapons on Danish soil. Uh, it's not just the right, we've also seen just with the uh, Socialist Volker Party gave up its uh, commitment to disarmament, which has been the cornerstone of, of the party since, uh, since it was founded. So we see, uh, I think, uh, new discussions taking place across left and right about nuclear weapons and a, a nuclear uh, Europe in the future. So I'm just going to end by saying that uh, it's all very you know, difficult to predict what's going to happen. It's uncertain now, but I think what is certain is that the Cold War, or maybe now even the post-Cold War, may have ended. We still very much live in the nuclear age. Is it on? Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you so much, Red. And now we're moving on to a new topic. We've heard a lot about what's going on in Russia, but what's going on in China? What's going on in India? I think that you, Luke Patey, senior researcher here at Deeps, you've been working on those topics for many years. China's foreign policy, security policy, China's role in Africa, China's role also more recently in Europe and in the Arctic. But please, Luke, you'll talk about, and I just have to find the right paper, which is just over here. No, it's not here. So what is the title of your... <laughs> your, your it's the title is uh, China, India, and the European Conflict in an Asian Century. Perfect. Thank you, Luke. Yeah, and that brings me right to my first point, which is we're in an Asian century. At some point in late 2019, early 2020, uh, Asia became more than half of the global economy. So it surpassed the West as the largest uh, uh, hemisphere uh, or in the world. And, and this is one, of I think, of the uh, defining characteristics of this conflict in Ukraine is that this is taking place um, just as the Asian century has begun. And it puts questions on how China, India, and others in Asia are going to respond. Now. Another defining characteristic of this conflict is, of course, the unprecedented use of economic sanctions um, by the United States, the EU, the UK, Japan, and others, which have frozen over $600 billion of, of Russian assets through its uh, central bank and really um, have severely limited the ability of the Russians to stabilize their currency, which we're seeing a financial crisis unfold as a result. And this, of course, leads to the question of, in an Asian century, how is, how is Asia going to respond to this? Um, and a lot of questions have been raised whether China, in particular, uh, will soften the blow of these uh, mostly Western sanctions against Russia and how that may um, change decision making. Now, of course, sanctions have a very uh, poor track record in working. Even the US government, which is uh, gung-ho about their use, uh, doesn't really point to many successful cases. Uh, but every case is different. Um, and in the Russian example, sanctions are, of course, accompanied by military assistance to Ukraine, uh, accompanied by ongoing peace talks. And they can work their way into the calculus of, of the Russians and others. But uh, will, will indeed China play a role in, in sanction busting or upsetting that, that, that possibility? So let's begin in Beijing. And, and I think to understand uh, China at large, but, but China's thinking in particular on, on, on the Ukraine conflict, we need to uh, 
to borrow some wisdom from a, an old proverb, which is, uh, watch what people uh, do. Don't listen to what they say. So since Russia's invasion of Ukraine, I've really lost count of the number of articles popping up in, in Danish and international media trying to dissect Beijing's latest messaging on, on Russia and the Ukraine conflict and, and whether Beijing is moving away from support to the Russians. And really, th these discursive arguments that are out there often pushed by, by Chinese ambassadors and officials and think tankers take our attention away from the actual support that China is giving Russia, has given Russia, and may very well give Russia in the future. They take our attention away from what chi China is actually doing because we're focused on what they're saying. <laughs> so Russia has been the largest recipient of Chinese loans, export credits, and other financial assistance since the year 2000. So it outpaces Pakistan and others that China gives a lot of uh, finance to over 125 billion since the turn of the century. And this didn't end after uh, Russia's first invasion of Ukraine in 2014. Um, the two sides after that, China and Russia really hardened their military cooperation, they hardened their technology cooperation. And last month, just weeks before the Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, President Putin traveled to Beijing he met President Xi Jinping. It was the first meeting that President Xi had in over two years since the start of the pandemic with a world leader. And the two men um, you know, coronated themselves as, as a no-limits partnership. And they signed over a billion dollars in energy deals to stamp that in. So China's been doing a lot um, uh, where it comes to Russia. But we don't really know what its future behavior in the coming months and years will, will head. We don't know that. But when we are watching what China does in the coming months and years, it's important not to think in black and white terminologies. Um, China, of course, doesn't want to get trapped in some of the US sanctions and Western sanctions. Uh, they don't want their companies to also face sanctions from dealing with, with Russian enti entities on the sanctions list. They have a lot of business in the US, much more than they have in Russia. So these companies and banks are probably going to shy away from dealing with the Russians. This is true. Um, but China can also back Russia at the same time. Um, two things can be true at the same time. Um, there are Chinese banks and there are Chinese companies that don't have a lot of activities in the United States and the West that are domestically focused. And they could, for example, do some of the trade and financial cooperation with Russia. In fact, uh, Professor Victor Shai uh, notes that when China's faced with a choice, it often chooses both options. So China has even a tactic where it will establish a new bank, it will establish a new company that is used to carry out this business with the sanctioned target. Um, they've done this in the past. Uh, with other targets of, of the US. And we could look at Iran in particular as an instructive case to understand what might come if China does support Russia moving forward. Now the second point is that China is not alone in its positioning towards Russia. Across Asia and the non-Western world, uh, the behavior of the US and the EU is really being scrutinized uh, at the moment. And most countries in the global south in Asia, in Africa, Middle East, Latin America, um, they haven't forgotten the West's long history of imperialism. Uh, more recently, they remember the US invasion of Iraq in 2003, and many of them, including the former uh, late uh, Kofi Annan, UN, UN Secretary General, see this as an unlawful invasion. So most want to live in a rule ba rules-based order where all countries' sovereignty will be respected, that these types of invasions won't happen. I think m many Global South countries are also kind of concerned that China is abandoning, seems to be abandoning its long-standing support of territorial sovereignty of other countries by not condemning the Russian invasion. But these countries also don't see the US as, as, def as a great defender of this norm. So while there has been a widespread condemnation of Russia's invasion in the, U in the Ukraine around the world, uh, the world is certainly not with the West when it comes to sanctions. Uh, in fact, China, India, Iran, Pakistan, and a few dozen other countries 
abstained from a recent UN ge General uh, Assembly vote denouncing the invasion. Even India, the world's largest democracy, um, they see themselves as a close partner to Russia. They abstain from that vote. They rely on Russia for a sizable portion of their arms and the maintenance of those arms, just as uh, many uh, Southeast Asian countries do. Um, they are very happy in New Delhi to be buying Russian oil at steep discounts, up to $30 uh, lower than the international price. So this is good for India um, to be buying th that oil on the cheap. But more, more so than any, um, as uh, the Indian scholar Rohan Mukherjee argues, India uh, wants to maintain its strategic autonomy. It doesn't want to dance to the dictates of, of the US or the West. It doesn't want to follow what China wants. It wants to be independent, and this is a way to show their independence and autonomy and to stay close to their Russian partner. This does not mean that there's not a diversity of views in Asia, um, Japan, South Korea have followed uh, many of the sanctions. Strikingly, for the first time in a very, very long time, Singapore has joined this sanctioned regime in many ways. Um, most countries in Southeast Asia have remained silent, uh, pretty silent on the conflict. Um, but they know well the diversity of imperialism that exists in the world, uh, Singapore and others being conquered by not only Europeans but Japanese later on and quite wary of a future of Chinese domination as well. And the Singaporean Prime Minister Li, Sh Li Xian Shen Luang said in a statement, uh, if international relations are based on might is right, the world will be a dangerous place for small countries like Singapore. Certainly the same can be said for Denmark as well. So back to the question, can Russia overcome the unprecedented sanctions against it and fulfill its objectives in Ukraine? Um, I think part of the pr trouble in answering this question is that we'll see sort of graphs of the trade that's going to be lost to Russia, the finance that they cannot access, and, and that reflected against what China and others do. But you would have to, therefore, uh, understand that Putin is making his decisions based on some economic logic. And I don't think that's the case. I think ideological and geopolitical interests uh, are really guiding his moves. So it's not a question if China can fill the gap. It's a question of can China soften the blow and allow Putin to uh, fulfill his objectives. And I think that's where finally the, the question swings back to us in the EU. You know, after some weeks of basking in this glow of some sort of new geopolitical European Union, cutting selective economic links with Russia, uh, making pledges to increase military spending, there now seems to be this growing hesitance to do much more, uh, including embargoing Russian oil and gas because of the consequences it would hold for us here in the EU. But the EU is Russia's largest trading partner after all. There's much the EU can do. Um, in fact, since the conflict began, the EU has paid some $17 billion for Russian oil, gas, and coal. The EU is very much funding uh, the Russian's economy uh, still. So perhaps the most defining characteristic of the international uh, response to the Ukraine crisis is the gap between what the EU says and what it does and, wasn't do and what it doesn't do in the coming years and months. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Lou. It's on. Yes, it's on. And our next speaker is Vibeke Skov Chalve. Uh, you worked uh, for years, for decades, on, on the U.S. foreign policy and society, etc. And more recently, for the f last four or five years, on specifically on the far right in the U.S. or the Christian conservative right, uh, and also its relation to Eastern Europe, which is important for, for your talk today, which is, and I found the paper, Russia... National Conservative Europe and the American Right. Please be because Chelve. Thank you. Um, I'm looking at the time now. We we have 20 minutes or so left, yes. including the Q and A, right? Okay. 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 Um, yes. Uh, I think an alternative title to make it very specific. What it is, I want to address here today would be something like, has the Ukraine made the American right return to NATO, or 
return to a democratic republican consensus on foreign policy and commitment to NATO? Um, and the answer to that from me would be no. Um, I just, the, 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 the imagery you see right here, I just picked it off the internet because everywhere across American homepages as in everywhere in, in Europe, right now you'll find symbolics that say, that says the United States stands with Ukraine. Uh, the Statue of Liberty stands with Ukraine and all of those symbolics of democracy, liberty and so on with Ukraine which is also the Biden narrative. And, um, and, um, and, I and, and sort of s to sum up what I'll be saying here, I'll say geopolitically, yes. In terms of um, supporting sanctions, yes. The Republican Party and the American right stands with Ukraine or stands with the Biden administration. But ideologically, no. And that also means that it's the Republican Party's support to um, sanctions uh, and the provision of, of, of weaponry to, uh, to Ukraine has slightly different, or not just slightly, has immensely different motivations than the Democratic Party's uh, and, uh, and the Biden administration's. Um, when we thought it was relevant to address this uh, topic, the American right in Russia, or the American right, the Republican Party, and, and the situation in Ukraine, it, it obviously the reason for that, and talking about that rather than talking about the Biden administration, which I won't really mention further today, uh, was of course that what came before the Biden administration was four years of a Trump administration that everybody saw move closer to Putin, um, uh, uh, with um, sort of words of admiration along the lines of Putin is a savvy strategist, he's a genius uh, statesman, um, he's an admirable or a formidable opponent, and so on and so forth. And, uh, and in the months leading up to the, to the war in Ukraine, uh, you'd have uh, a figure like Tucker Carlson, whom I'm sure everyone has uh, seen um, sort of pro-Putin rants from also in, uh, in the weeks after the invasion. Pro-Putin rants in the sense that with some distancing from the fact that Russia has now invaded a sovereign country, which is something that the American right does not like, uh, that this American right does not like either, um, because sovereignty and national sovereignty and borders and so on are such a core principle. Nevertheless, admiration of the fact that we told you so, look, he is a formidable strategist. He outsmarted you. This is exactly what we said in f during our four years in office. We said, you talk, you liberals, you talk, you, s you set up s systems of regulation and governance and so on, and in the meantime, stronger statesmen outsmart you. So we're, talk we're addressing this topic today because there's an American right, this is Josh uh, Hawley, by the way, the senator, from uh, Missouri, who's also very at in very much in admiration of Putin. Um, so we're talking about this topic today because you have an American right that for, for not just for the past five years, five to seven years, but for the past couple of months has in many ways applauded the strategies and the maneuvering of Putin while at the same time have felt force, forced to position itself as it became clear that Putin was in fact um, intending on actually uh, invading Ukraine and hence um, invading a country that the American right also aligns itself with, a region that it also aligns itself very much with, Central Eastern Europe. Um, and, and, um, and in that sense, um, opposing a principle of sovereignty. So while there have been these words of admiration, there's also been another narrative on the American right, and I would say this is the main reason why the right in the US and, and the majority of the Republican Party, from the Tucker Carlson wing of it, and to what many would call the more moderate wing of uh, a Mitch McConnell, this is the main reason why that American right has now moved to support sanctions. There's the principle of supporting Ukrainian border sovereignty, national sovereignty, but above all, there's an argument about energy. Because the narrative, which really hasn't received much attention in Europe, but the, but the argument on the American right 
an argument which makes the American right now feels vindicated that it was right all along in its understanding of the global arena um, is to say the Biden administration paid for Putin's war. The Biden administration is in many ways responsible for Putin being in Ukraine today because the first thing that the Biden administration did was to recommit the US to the Paris Agreement. And what did that do? It restricted American um, possibilities of delivering uh, fossil fuels to the global um, market, driving up prices, and um, in that sense, enriching Putin. Had Biden not recommitted the US to the Paris Agreement, and had he not shown such weakness in leaving Afghanistan, but the primary argument is the Paris Agreement, had he not done that, the US would have been able, in the month leading up to the war, to just pour American oil out into the market, drive down oil prices, and simply rob Putin of the possibility of being wealthy enough to wage this war. This is the narrative. So this is very much, if you, if you go into even a Mitch McConnell Twitter account, you'll see he talks about energy all of the time. And remember, the American right, particularly the contemporary American right, uh, the American right of some of the figures I just showed you, has its constituency in the American South and the American Midwest, which is uh, the coal and oil and gas producing, or part of the coal and oil and gas producing part of the US. So this is the argument. And this, to this right, does not, this entire reading of the situation does not suddenly make it feel, oops, we were wrong to, um, show admiration for a figure like Putin. We were wrong in our entire and sort of push for a more nationalist, protectionist, energy autonomy, because this was a large part of the Bush uh, or the Trump uh, agenda. Uh, um, it doesn't make them think all of those principles were wrong. On the contrary, this American right feels vindicated in its understanding of geopolitical competition and, and ultimately see sanctions as part of a movement towards a more protectionist, nationalist based world order. And this is if, if climate is one thing to think through, like what are the long term implications of some of what's happening here, I would say that um, that's another dimension. We talk about dependency but the opposite to dependency is, of course, to return to some sort of nationalist, protectionist logic, even if within a region more than just within national borders. So the American right has fallen into the ranks of supporting sanctions against Russia, and it's fallen into the ranks of providing wep weaponry to Ukraine. But do not believe that that signals sort of a return to the old Cold War consensus. And that's my second point here. Um, and the aspect that actually my own research deals more with in many G than American uh, energy discussions. Um, because I think in many ways, we've completely sort of overlooked what the, old what the old Cold War consensus between liberals and conservatives or the Democrats, this is somewhat somewhat simplistic uh, presentation of it, Democrats and Republicans in the US was all about. I sh this, is a, this is a photo of Mike Pompeo, um, Trump's foreign minister, or last foreign minister, um, uh, standing right next to a um, statue of, of Ronald Reagan on a plaza in Hungary. And I think in many ways this summarizes uh, the whole mythology of, and the geography of uh, the American rights, understanding of what the struggle between democracy and totalitarianism was all about. Because the old consensus, the old Cold War consensus, the one between a liberal democratic West or a free West and a totalitarian um, East and Soviet Union was built around anti-communism anti-socialism and anti-atheism. The Soviet Union was a force of modernity in the views of the conservatives of the and the Republican Party. 
That was one of the reasons why Reagan so opposed it. Because socialism is the opposite of hierarchy. It's the op it, it installs principles of total equality. It erodes the foundations of the family. It erodes all sort of conventional institutions of authority in society. That was, it was godless communism that was the enemy. And the, and the consensus with the liberals and with the European, or it wasn't the European Union back then, but with the, with the, the old coal and steel union and, and, and later on um, the, Western, um, uh, the Western European countries, was a consensus built around the defense of Christian democracy. This was openly the language used then. That was not an open uh, wording. That was what every also liberal leader in, uh, in, uh, in Eastern or in, uh, in Western Europe would call it. Today, it is actually the European Union and it is Western Europe that is forcing, if viewed with the eyes of a Mike Pompeo and the American right, that is forced, that is sort of up in th on the front lines of opposed or, or um, enforced uh, standardization, equalization, the opposition to any kind of, of, of conventional order of and family authority and so on. So the tables have turned in that respect. It's Eastern Europe, it's Russia that are the ideological allies here. Um, and it is Western Europe that is in some ways ideologically the enemy, which we see when we discuss principles of migration, family law, um, LBQ, LBQ, LBQBT rights, and so on and so forth. Um, and just to give you a sense, I think this has gone very much under the radar, so just to give you a sense of where some of this takes place, the World Congress of Families, an American-initiated organization, but with Russian participation, not just some small um, um, some small NGO, a massive institution with huge funds that supported, um, for instance, the uh, campaign for anti-abortion in Poland, and that has primarily Russian and American sponsors that meet every year, sometimes in Moldova, sometimes in the Czech Republic, sometimes in Russia, sometimes in the US, and connects the American and the Russian and the Central Eastern European right. And I would give another example, one that actually speaks, the one that speaks to um, a question raised earlier on about how can Putin um, make an argument about uh, persecution of, uh, of uh, Russian minorities or a, or a Holocaust uh, uh, taking place in Ukraine. That whole, that whole language of feeling persecuted of sharing a sense of victimhood um, is one that the American right and the Russian national conservatives and uh, some of their allies in, in uh, Central Eastern Europe have developed together, often headed by Orban in, for instance, in under the organizational heading of uh, the persecution of Christians or Jewish Christian uh, civilization. Um, that where the American right also participates. So, um, yeah, to close things off, since we have limited time, I just want to say that when the American right looks at Europe and sort of the map of NATO, yes, they do see a geopolitical line where Russia is the enemy. In terms of protecting certain boundaries and protecting also the, the sort of the sovereign integrity of Poland and Hungary, um, which, is ver which are very close allies. But when they look at that map, they also see another, they also have another way sort of, of drawing the, the its alliances and allegiances. One where Russia is part of the conservative family and, um, and is actually the new ally or part of the family of allies that support a Christian understanding of authority, a conservative Christian understanding of authority, the family, um, democracy, and so on. And where the EU and Western Europe is in some ways the enemy. So I do not see a sudden return to a NATO consensus. Thank you very yeah. much, Vivica. <laughs>
as Thomas said in his talk, uh, there's a tendency to, to push uh, difficult questions ahead, and the same goes a bit for time. So we now have one quarter of an hour left for, for questions, and uh, the floor is open, and I see one, uh, one person down there wants to, to ask a question. Please, the mic. Hello, uh, this is Michelle Rasmussen from the Schiller Institute. Uh, thank you for this uh, event. Um, we are also going to be having an international video conference on April 9th to discuss uh, calling an international conference to establish a new uh, security and economic architecture. And my question is that um, in the same way as there are negotiations now between Russia and Ukraine, should, shouldn't we set up an international mechanism to address the security concerns of countries before it gets to war? For example, uh, I'm against this war, uh, but we also have to recognize that we have to look at the role of NATO expansion against the East, for example, and other uh, questions. So a uh, question to Luke and to, um, to uh, Heinz. Uh, because of the danger of nuclear war, should we set up an international mechanism for addressing security and uh, economic concerns of all nations? Thank you so much. I think we'll just take three questions, uh, and thank you for stating your name and your affiliation. And please, you're the next one. You'll have the mic over here. Well, okay. Yeah, okay, thanks. Uh, my name is Matthew. Um, I'm just going to raise this from a Russian perspective. Um, I've worked in Donbass for years. I worked in Luhansk, so I was with Danske Flutlingelv, <coughs> and then I was with the OSC observation mission. Um, I've also worked for NATO with the Germans in Afghanistan. Um, now I work with the UN, I also work with Morningstar, but I'm here in a very personal capacity. Everybody seems to be going on from the from kind of the first speaker, and um, uh, Fleming just has this tone, this incredible tone that kind of Russia has lost. They don't know what they're doing, they're off the rails. Um, I can tell you from a Russian hard power perspective, they are gaining significantly. They are winning in many, many different ways. They've pretty much got all of the Black Sea coasts now. Um, they've got, they, they're focusing a lot on the technological sector, which is going to be booming there. They have, um, they have a narrative that's running internally about how they don't actually need the West anymore. They've effectively put the line in the sand and said, we are now an Asian country going forward. And that is a win for them. This isn't 1990 where they didn't, all of their current partners that they have are weak. UAE is strong, Pakistan is strong, China is strong, Mongolia is actually quite strong, India is very strong. They have made a very calculated decision and they are steps ahead. From this European perspective, where I'm a Canadian sitting here in Europe for several years, the narrative is that the Russia has miscalculated, they've made a large mistake. I assure you they're steps ahead. Putin's approach is quite simple, high risk strategy, see the reaction, pause, reflect, Go strategy number two. Call it plan A, B, C, D. No, call them all plan A. And this, and okay, my question is, yes, my question you, to Luke. So going ahead for, the Asian for, th for this Asian century, <laughs> which benefits do you see in the first three to four weeks of this conflict to Asia? Which, in, in his Asian relationships, where's the benefit? And there's a question before on a very practical level. When you're talking about energy security, um, I don't know if she's still here, Trina, but hi. Uh, I'm very surprised you didn't talk about the timeline of how Russia, from again, from their perspective, how they've calculated in shifting the pipelines to China with, you know, конечно, вот это Восток Союз, а тоже the, yeah, what you would call the, what do they call it, the spirit of, uh, spirit of Siberia, number two. So what's the timeline on that so they can shift their oil going east? Because we're just looking from a European perspective. They're not. Thanks. Thank, thank you so much. We'll take four questions and then we close the floor down in the back. Uh, my name is Nikolai Luner. I'm a organizational psychologist. Recently, I've heard uh, a great many scholars, mostly from war studies, express rather strong doubts about whether the U.S. will actually adhere 
uh, the musketeer to the musketeer oath of NATO in, in actual practice, for instance, if there is an attack on the Baltic states. I've been sort of puzzled that this doesn't seem to play a part in Danish public debate, and I would be grateful to hear if you have any comments on that, particularly uh, in relation to uh, the, the, uh, the American right wing that we just heard about. What will be their view or their take on this issue? Thank you. Thank you so much. And the very last question. Uh, Dwight Robinson, uh, University of Copenhagen Political Science. Um, Thomas Schelling, he, um, in his theory of deterrence, says that credibility is paramount for deterrence. So how credible is uh, NATO's deterrence uh, capabilities in that regard uh, when it comes to Russia? And just switching that to Asia, how credible is America's um, you know, ability to stop Chinese adventurism um, in that region, specifically regarding Taiwan? Thank you very much for great questions. I think there were questions for all of you, so we'll just have a go here. Who would like to start? Rebikis, would you? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, I think there was only one uh, question that was directed uh, at me, which was the uh, question about would the U.S. right respond, or how would the U.S. right respond if there was an invasion in... in uh, in um, yeah, the one of the Baltic uh, countries. Um, I honestly can't answer, but I, I think that is too unpredictable. Exactly which side would win and what would happen to the public uh, debate uh, in in a U.S. context. But I will say my general sense is that um, the the majority of the Republican Party today would not be interested in going to war in Europe um, and would not be interested in being involved in the war. And some of the early signals there uh, before the war escalated was also the Ukraine. Who wants to go to war in the U I mean for the U for the Ukraine? Um, it is the, the parts of of the party that now dominate. I can't really see them voting for something like that. Um, unless it was suddenly caught in some sort of masculine narrative about sort of the gung-ho opposition towards um, Putin. And another s aspect that I didn't address is that, of course, the party still has voices uh, that reflect more sort of the old-school Republican realist perspective that have been arguing, shouldn't we be a little more outspoken about the fact that you the Ukraine will never be accepted into NATO, you know, the acceptance, sort of a more ki Kissinger-like uh, narrative around, shouldn't we accept the idea of buffer states and so on? Um, so, so I don't think the atmosphere at the moment or the narrative in the party at all is for a US committed to large-scale war in Europe. Okay, um, I'll address the, the first question, Michelle. Uh, thanks for that. Um, obviously, there is the UN Security Council, which hasn't been uh, as active as we would hope in stopping uh, this conflict. Um, and UN Security Council reform has been up there, which the Indians would like uh, to see move ahead. But uh, you know, the permanent members, including China, have been quite against that. Um, even when African countries raise it, uh, they, they block uh, uh, the ability of, of those countries to really raise this issue. So Security Council reform is there, it's on the table, but the, the big players, China and the US uh, and others need to, to move on it. Um, what I don't <laughs> particularly, um, well, what I think is being missed in these debates of, of, of if, it's bla if we should blame NATO expansion for the conflict and, and instigating it as uh, you know, some Many do. I mean, some scholars in the U.S. and even, uh, of course, the Chinese official view has been constant that uh, it was the U.S. and NATO that instigated this conflict. Um, but this really strips um, Ukrainians of any agency whatsoever, uh, it, that it's just the U.S. deciding. Um, and I think we need to decentralize the U.S. Um, as a capable actor in international politics. It's not always the one pulling the strings, I'm afraid. Um, Ukrainians, uh, as in other conflicts, uh, nationals, have a lot of say in what happens. It's not just the big states. Um, 
Thanks for an excellent question, Matthew. And I, I share your skepticism on um, whether uh, Russia will actually come out of this um, also bad after all. Uh, I mean, Putin might fulfill his objectives, and that is, is good for him and his supporters. Um, that's why, I mean, I, I wanted to just raise the point that Asia uh, uh, is very much uh, prevalent in, in our global affairs today, and, and keeping attention on that is, is, is vital, um, because they can very much do a lot. Uh, they, I mean, it's quite diverse, but China and, and others uh, can do a lot to, to lessen the pain, economic pain that Russian feels, and uh, after the conflict, uh, to, to help Russia rebuild um, its, its you know, battered economy. Um, so how does Asia benefit? I don't know if I want to take on the entire continent. Uh, I, how does China benefit? Um, because they're going to be, I think, if they do continue to, to support Russia, they'll be the biggest player um, in Asia. Uh, so firstly, you know, China benefits because it takes the West's attention away from China. Um, this conflict. Um, so we're not really talking about what's going on in Xinjiang right now. We're not talking about Hong Kong. We're not talking about uh, the need for European companies to invest more in the Indo-Pacific region. We're focused on Ukraine for, for good reason, of course, but we're taking our attention away from Asia and that's, you know, that's hunky-dory for China. Um, they would like to, to have the dominant role in, in East Asia. Um, at the same time, uh, however, there's some, some side effects, negative side effects, I think, for China from this, this conflict. Uh, that is that the West seems more united than it was just a month ago. And whether those geopolitical uh, actions that are being taken against Russia can be uh, imposed on China in the future uh, is very much on the minds of, of, of you know, decision makers in China right now and learning from the sanctions that are being placed on Russia and, and figuring out how China can avoid such future pressure. Um, there's other sort of things going on in East Asia too. The, the Japanese, uh, the Koreans, the Taiwanese are, are paying attention. And they're also thinking, uh, I, I would say, uh, particularly in Japan, thinking more about uh, nuclear options, uh, nuclear sharing. Um, former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe uh, raised this issue uh, in, in recent speeches. So they're concerned. Um, and that gets to the last question uh, of what about Taiwan? And I mean, the, you know, Trina raised the question of, in, or raised the point that Eastern Europeans had been pointing out to us here in Western Europe of the problem of Russia, uh, that, you know, be worried about energy security, be worried about uh, Russian uh, intentions. Well, Eastern Asians, um, Japan uh, and Taiwan in particular, are pointing out the problem of China. Are we going to listen to the, the neighbors of the Chinese? Or are we just going to ignore it until it's too late? That's one question I think that will we'll now uh, uh, generate more attention to Taiwan, but of course Taiwan isn't the Ukraine, it's far away from Europe, and I would not expect, um, at this moment at least, much European reaction to any invasion of, of Taiwan in the coming uh, months and years. Um, but that really calculus hasn't changed for me. Um, but I, I, would, I would just say that I think you know, that, that decision will be decided by domestic politics and the domestic economy in China and how it's going and whether Xi Jinping sees a risk in, in taking those steps for invasion. Uh, and right now, I think, because of what he sees from the sanctions, um, that timeline has been, has been pushed. He sees that the U.S. Is, is willing to use quite drastic measures financially, and he doesn't want uh, China's economy, which is you know, slowing gradually, but slowing. He doesn't want that that descent to uh, expedite uh, because of American sanctions. Yeah, just to this question about Russian collapse, um, I'm I'm also not one of those. I think sharing the view that Russia is is close to collapse. I will say though that m um, a military conflict and war is unpredictable. <laughs> um, you, you know, violence rarely gets to the objectives you're looking for very quickly. It creates more violence and more unpredictability. So, you know, who, kn who knows where this will go? Um, but I think so far our predictions have been by uh, uh, have, have been wrong. First, people were thinking this probably would not be a war. Then they said it would be over quickly. Um, and now I think we have to be very careful with overconfident predictions that Russia will collapse and Putin will face domestic opposition. Uh, 
And another reason why I think this can be a very dangerous narrative is because it props up the argument that the West should not be afraid of escalation and get involved uh, more directly uh, with in, in, in the war with Russia because Russia is close to collapse. I think this would be a very overconfident miscalculation. That's exactly the kind of things that get bigger wars uh, started. Um, in terms of... Um, Credibility, yeah, uh, <laughs> you know, this is comes back to the what I said. Does do the do the Russians respect the border? Be you know, do they know the difference between a NATO member state and a non uh, member state? Um, well, the problem is we can only tell afterwards, I guess. No, um, I think if 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 they wouldn't, I would not expect uh, NATO to reply, you know, immediately with a nuclear attack. But we will see in. in uh, a conventional stepping up of the conflict for sure, I think. And I think NATO member states made it very clear that's what can be expected if uh, Putin would overstep that boundary. At the same time, they're doing everything, you know, to keep the conflict confined to Ukraine at the moment. Um, and in terms of the new security architecture, I can only, you know, I can speak about the nuclear side of things, and there it, uh, it doesn't look good. It's really, we're kind of entering a new Cold War, if you kind of want to use that an analogy, but without really all the agreements that were, nuclear agreements that were in place during the Cold War. So, so far the START agreement is the only one, uh, only bilateral agreement between the United States and Russia left, which kind of limits the, uh, the amount of strategic missiles that each party has. Uh, it's just been renewed at the beginning of the Biden administration. It was one of the first things he did after Trump hesitated. It's been uh, um, another five years. So, you know, I think even that, that future looks very bleak and will very much depend on um, the next uh, American president um, in power, whether that agreement will, have will, will survive uh, in the near future. So I think... When it comes to nuclear weapons, I think there's very little hope now that, I mean, we can all agree we would need such an, a framework, but right now it, it seems to be going, it is going the other way, that the international agreements that were in place are either uh, uh, disappearing or, hollowing or hollowed out. Thank you to all of you. Um, we had a brief discussion here. If you have other question the good news are that there are sandwiches outside and uh, you have the possibility to to discuss and ask all your questions but before we and, and i just also wanted to to remind you that at noon uh fleming Slidsbo will uh make another session so please stay on if you want to 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 look at that or hear his, his speech and before we close i'll just uh, give uh, pass the floor to my colleague robin may shot for some closing remarks of course, I can't say anything by summation. We're opening windows, uh, not closing them off, and hence Manny's uh, encouraging you to pursue the discussion uh, in the break. But I do think uh, we've tried to contribute to this 360-degree global discussion, looking uh, under the water, <laughs> above the land, into the skies, into the past, into the future, uh, how people uh, don't forget the history of Soviet Union and what that means as a colonial history, the U.S. Uh, incursion over sovereign territory and how that uh, impacts uh, Asian and African perspectives on the current conflicts, how these all become embedded in political, religious, ideological contestations with uh, both domestic and international impact. These will all affect our futures and of course, it will be many years from now that we're still trying to understand the implications. So I'll ask you to join me in thanking our excellent speakers today. <laughs> As Manny said, uh, we have a second seminar at 12. It, it, it is officially fully booked, uh, so do stay and have lunch if you're registered. There may be room if you haven't registered, though I'm not supposed to say that, but please uh, speak with our speaker.